What's up everybody? Welcome back to the OG family. Make sure y'all smash that like button. Subscribe to my channel only if you want to. But look, my beautiful people, we got these five disturbing 911 calls made by serial killers. Well, by killers, you know? I, I don't know why everybody's serial killers, but they are to me. Uh, but look, man, let's get this video right here to 5,000 likes, my people. And let's hop into this video without further ado. Because you know how I do. That's bars. Look, I was thinking about that. Whatever, man. From a teenager who confessed to a double murder to a serial killer who called 911 many times. Today, Fact Faction looks at five killers' disturbing calls to emergency services. First up is the shocking confession made by 17-year-old Jake Evans, who called 911 to report the murder of his mother and younger sister. In the call, which was made in 2012, Jake explained in terrifying detail how he killed both his mother and sister using a gun he had stolen from his grandfather, and talked about his thoughts before and after the killings. He explained that he was influenced by the horror film Halloween, he admired the killer in the it's film the because fuck? he did not have any empathy. Leading up to the incident, Evans had gotten angry at his 15-year-old sister, Mallory, due to hearing her say something racist. According to Evans, this made him despise his family, and as a result, he saw them as bullies and racists. In his full four-page confession, Jake also explained that he in his last life he was probably black or something like that, so that's why he explained why like he kind of mad or something. Planning on killing his grandparents who lived opposite his house, as well as his older sister, but had second thoughts after the murders. In 2015, Evans was sentenced to 45 years in prison. That's it. Parker County 911, where is your emergency? Uh, my house. Okay, what's the emergency? Uh, I just killed my mom and my sister. What? I just killed my mom and my sister. You just killed your mother and your sister? How did you do that? Uh, I shot... See, she almost panicked for a little bit. What? Look, it was she about to go crazy. That's that's not something that you just talk about naturally like this. This is crazy, bro. It's a, uh, 22 revolver. Are you sure they're dead? Yes. Wow. My guy was so calm. Next up is Brian Sweat. At the age of 27, he committed mass murder in Greenwood County, South Carolina. His victims ranged from the ages of 9 to 51 years old. Mm. Among the victims were Chandra Fields, the mother of Sweat's baby daughter, both of her parents, and two of Chandra's nephews. It is believed that Sweat had broken in and waited for the victims in their home while they were out, and wow. then took them hostage as soon as they returned. He bound them with duct tape and then shot the majority of them. He then called 911 and calmly told the operator that he was about to commit suicide and that he was extremely stressed. He also told them that he had a weapon in hand. Greenwood 911, may help you? Oh, yes. I had an officer, a 2007 Calvin Highway. What's wrong? Oh. I'm just stressed out, and I'm about to take my life, and I mean, look. What's your name? It's unknown. Okay, do you have a weapon with you? Huh? Do you have a weapon with you? Yes. Do y'all hear the woman in the background, bro? Do y'all hear the woman in the background? She's pleading. Like, that's crazy. Get in there. Don't point at me. What's going on? Oh. Before the tragedy took place, Sweat wrote many Facebook posts stating how angry he was with Chandra, as according to him, Chandra was stopping him from seeing his daughter. Fortunately, there were some lives that Sweat spared on the day of the massacre, one of whom was his daughter, who he told to get out of the house, as well as four other children. The children ran to an... Look, they think dudes don't care when you try to take your kids from me. That's one, that's one spot where I, I be feeling some type of way too about, but it'll make you have some thoughts, man. Like, somebody trying to keep you away from your uh, from your kids and stuff. It's crazy, man. But I ain't saying you go that far. But 
Look, guys, dogs. Cells, and the neighbor also called 20,000 pounds a week. He enjoyed traveling and would always fly business class, even though he officially classed himself as a plasterer. While in Thailand, Cregan lost his left eye after getting into a fight. Back in England in May 2000... You didn't got your goddamn eyeball punched out your head, man. See, that's why you don't be out here just fighting, I'm telling you. The 29-year-old got into another fight in a pub and ended up shooting and killing 23-year-old Mark Short. During the incident, Cregan also attempted to kill three other men. Two and a half months later, Dale Cregan traveled to Mark Short's 46-year-old father's house and murdered him in the same fashion before throwing a hand grenade at his body. After being on the run for some time, oh. on September 18, 2012, Cregan murdered two female police officers by shooting them at least eight times each and throwing an M75 hand grenade at them. In order to get the police the to his house, he had made a hoax call to 999 and made up a story of an attempted burglary. On the phone, Cregan provided the phone operator with in-depth detail about the criminal and told them where the supposed criminal had fled to and even made a joke. What is really disturbing about this phone conversation is how he calmly told the operator that he would be waiting for the police. Look, this right here is the, this is a psychopath right here. And this is the crazy part, bro. Like, I can't believe that he already shooting people up. He, you dead. And then he'll fucking throw a grenade at you. Savage on a, a, a thousand percent. And, and I guess he don't give a fuck no more. He ain't got no eyeball, man. So that's a little creepy. It's amazing, I have so much for the big concrete slapping. Is that window or not? officers arrived at the house in Greater Manchester, That's the one. Cregan opened the door and immediately began shooting at the officers, who unfortunately did not have a chance to react. After the brutal murders, Cregan traveled to a local police station and handed himself in. He wow. told them proudly that he was wanted by the police and then confessed to his awful crimes. On June 13, 2013, Cregan was found guilty of four counts of murder and three counts of attempted murder and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Damn. If he was here in the United States, he would have got the death penalty instantly. You know, you kill a cop, they're going to try to, they going to bury, bury you like a cop is not a regular person. I don't see why their lives are more valuable. I don't, I don't get it, you know. But, you know, I'm black, so I guess everybody's life is more valuable. I don't know. Just saying. 
On August 3rd, 2010, Omar Thornton was called into his place of work at the Hartford Distributors in Manchester, Connecticut, and was confronted with security camera footage which showed him stealing beer. The 34-year-old was a delivery driver for the distributors, and because of the theft was given the options of either resigning from the company or being fired. I Thornton decided to sign the resignation papers. Shortly after the signing, and without warning, Thornton pulled out two semi-automatic pistols, which he had been concealing in his bag, oh. and opened fire. In a matter of minutes, he had murdered eight employees and seriously injured two others. After the shooting was over, Omar locked himself in an off- Hey, Omar got black people out here looking bad, ain't he? Like, you a serial killer at this point, brother. Like, bro, you killing everybody at the office because you lost your job. And called his mother and informed her of the massacre. He also told her that he was about to take his own life. He then called 911 and gave his reasons for the shooting. Here is the call. State police. It is 911. Yeah, can I help you? <laughs> what? Martin, the, uh, the shooter over in Manchester. Yes, where are you, sir? I'm in the building. Uh, you probably want to know the reason why I shot this picture up. Let's pick it in the reason, please. Yep, I understand that. Yeah, they treat me bad over there. They treat all those black employees bad over there, too. So I take it to my own hands and handle the problem. I wish I, I, wish I could have gotten more to people. Yeah. Oh, hey, Mark, shit. Sir, do you have a weapon with you? Oh, yeah, Mark. How many don't you have with you? I got one now. This one I was one out in the, uh, in the uh, factory there. Yep. Yeah. Okay, sir. I'm, I'm not going to kill nobody else, though. We're going to have to have you surrounding yourself somehow here. Not make the situation any worse, you know what I mean? These cops are going to kill me. No, they're not. We're just going to have to get you to relax. I'm going to have you, you know, turn yourself over. How much ammunition do you have with you? I got a lot of shots left. Uh-oh. What's that? All right. I guess this guy is lower and particular business. Um... Tell my people about to love them. Yeah. And I got to go there. Oh, my. Oh, damn. Like, he got a little choked up there at the end, you know what I'm saying? But he he knew he was... That's crazy. He said, I wish I could have got more of them. After the call ended, Thornton took his own life by shooting himself in the head before police could get to him. His family and ex-girlfriend claimed that he had complained many times that he was being racially discriminated at work. His ex also claims that she saw a picture on his phone which showed racist graffiti inside the bathroom where he worked. The company's president, other employees, and union officials are adamant that the racist claims are not true. Of course not, but damn, you didn't have to shoot the place up though. Damn. The last killer on this list is probably the most infamous, as he made numerous chilling phone calls over the span of two years. His phone calls to the authorities were so strange that he was nicknamed the Weepy Voiced Killer. His name was Paul Michael Stefani. After each brutal crime he committed, he would call the police in an emotional manner and confess, but would never give his name. It all started on New Year's Eve in 1980, after he beat a female named Karen Potak so badly that she gained a brain trauma and was close to dying. The 21-year-old was walking home from a New Year's party late at night in Minneapolis when she was brutally attacked with a tire iron. Stefani then called hey. 911 and informed the police where the woman was. Yes, please, this is an emergency. Please send a squad to just on the road. A small big manufacturing company machine shop. Please, there's an ambulance too. There's a girl hurt there. Can you tell me what happened here? There's two reasons that she's laying on the ground in the back. Cause that, cause that ain't creepy, yo. That mug kind of sound like Chris Sales, man. At the at the same time, the weeping boy. <laughs> Damn, that's crazy. To, man, he sounds she just like Chris Sales. She was hospital with severe injuries, but survived the attack. Stefani's next victim was 18-year-old Kimberly Compton. Kimberly accepted a ride from Stefani in June 1981 after meeting him in a diner. Using an ice pick, Stefani stabbed the teenager 61 times and then once again called 911 and confessed. 61 times. 
Two days later, Stefani called back and apologized for the murder and claimed that he would turn himself in. However, he never did. Eight days after killing Kimberly, the weepy voice killer called 911 and yet again apologized. In 1982, Stefani murdered another woman, Kathleen Greening, by drowning her in her bathtub, but this time did not call to confess the crime. Later that year, Barbara Simons was stabbed over 100 times and her body was found in a Minneapolis river. Two days later, police received this call. Stefani's final victim was a 21-year-old prostitute named Denise Williams. Stefani picked her up and took her to his apartment to have sex. After leaving the apartment, instead of dropping the young woman back at the red light district as he had promised, Stefani drove down a dark and secluded road and brutally attacked her with a screwdriver. He stabbed her multiple times. Fortunately, Denise was able to strike him in the head with a glass bottle and Damn. managed to get away. As a result, Stefani was bleeding pretty badly, so he decided to call for medical help. Investigators recognized his voice and were able to link this call to the attack on Denise Williams, and Stefani was arrested. Investigators were then also able to link Stefani to the murder of Barbara Simons, and in 1983, he was given a 40-year sentence. After many years in prison, in 1997, Paul Stefani confessed to all of his crimes, and police were able to officially link him to the weepy-voiced killer calls. Paul Stefani died in prison in 1998 after suffering from skin cancer. Damn, that's crazy, bro. It's some, there's some real psychopaths out here in the world like that, bro. He's really talking to police, calling them like, yo. What in the hell? But man, hey, at the same time, man, let me know how y'all felt about this video right here. Y'all check out. Y'all watch out for yourselves, man. Y'all never know who's off the rocker. Well, sometimes you can kind of tell you see one dude with the glasses on earlier in the video. You can tell. And the dude, any dude that rocked just the Uncle Phil out here, I think you are on your path to becoming a serial killer. Uh, but look, man, I'll see you on the next video. And um, yeah, man, spread love because there's too much hate in this world. Love you guys. See you in the next video. And I'm out, though. I'm a give him time to fold up She think I'm a flex on her when I roll up Shit, from the toes up When it come to my drip, it's different Get the uh, bricks flippin' When it